Almost a year ago now, I played through the original 90s Alone in the Dark. I'm sure that when it initially came out, it was an incredible experience, but nowadays it's a pretty rough one. So when I heard there was going to be a new Alone in the Dark game coming out, I was stoked. A full reimagining of the original game, but with some of the same characters and a totally new story with modern gameplay. Thanks to the folks at THQ Nordic, I even got an early copy of the game so I could make a video for you all. This video is not sponsored though, so I'm going to be giving my honest and unfiltered thoughts on the game, both the good and the bad. I am a little bit worried since most of the modern Alone in the Dark games are supposedly terrible, but I have some high hopes for this one. Right off the bat, the vibes are immaculate. Smooth jazz with a deep and ominous lead, dark imagery and mostly cool colored illustrations with a few orange accents. It takes the ambiance of a 1920s noir film, which is super up my alley. There are two different difficulty settings, one for combat and one for puzzles. For combat, I played on standard mode during my first playthrough and easy mode on my second playthrough, since I just wanted to get through the other half of the story. The difficulty for puzzles is a little bit more unusual. To start, you choose between modern, which highlights interactable items and gives puzzle hints, or old school, which leaves you completely alone. The system is actually fully customizable in settings, which is awesome. I personally would recommend leaving on highlighted items, but turning off the hints. It's easy to miss items and grind the game to a halt without an indicator of what you can grab, but the puzzle hints are also a little too hyperactive. I'll give some more examples as we go along. The game starts off with a discussion between Emily Hartwood and Edward Carnby. Carnby is a private investigator hired by Emily due to some mounting concerns about her uncle, Jeremy. Jeremy is a patient at a home for the mentally fatigued known as Dercetto. Jeremy sent her a letter stating that a dark man is stalking him. Emily obviously brushed this off as nonsense. Most Hartwoods tend to go mad before they grow old, so this is kind of par for the course. Jeremy, fully convinced that he was possessed, decided to call upon Dercetto's Dr. Gray for assistance. When he got there, he came to the conclusion that all of the patients and staff were part of a cult. Emily doesn't believe that this cult even exists, let alone that the members are after her uncle, but she still wants to check up on him. She didn't feel safe going alone, so she hired Carnby. She doesn't know what they'll do once they find Jeremy, but she made sure that both herself and the detective were armed before arriving, just to be safe. This is definitely a really interesting setup. Jeremy doesn't seem mentally well, but Dercetto itself is also giving off some very uneasy vibes. A mental institution is always an interesting setting for a horror game, and this one functions out of a previously existing manner so that we aren't just in a boring, stale environment. At this point, you get to choose between Edward and Emily. Each of their stories follow the same broad strokes gameplay-wise, with some drastically different cutscenes and story beats. You get a completely different part of the story on each side, encouraging you to play the game through twice, which I did. I played as Carnby in the original game, so I'll be starting as him this time around. Carnby is played by David Harbour, while Emily is played by Jodie Comer. David Harbour is a great actor. I loved him in every piece of media that I've seen him in, and there's no difference this time around. He plays the charming but determined old-school detective really well, making him a lot more interesting than the blank mustachioed canvas that was the original Carnby. I'm less of a fan of Jodie Comer here. She struggles to convey emotions through her voice coming across as kinda robotic. I know, I know, I'm one to talk. It's not immersion-breaking, but it did reinforce my choice to play as Carnby. Emily knocks on the front door, receiving no response. Edward takes things into his own hands, opening a side door. This door leads to a garage where Carnby gets a flashlight to attach to his vest. This is activated with a V, which is kind of an awkward keybind. I ended up swapping things around for comfort, making melee attacks and accessing the inventory the side buttons on my mouse while activating the flashlight with F. It's a lot more comfortable to play this game with a controller, although I do prefer shooting with a mouse. The only weird controller binding was that the inventory button was the PlayStation screenshot button instead of the touchpad. That might be different on consoles, but that was my experience on PC. Carnby moves through the garage and into the back garden. The conservatory is unlocked, containing a key to the basement and a gigantic tree making ominous whispering noises. There are clues scattered about, mainly taking the form of things like notebooks and letters. All of these are fully voice acted, which is great. Seeing a wall of text in a video game is never fun, so having someone else read it to you can be beneficial for some people, if a bit slow. You can stop the audio at any time with the press of a button, although I kinda wish the default was manually starting it. They even have some flair here and there, with the audio for the receipt here playing back a recreation of the entire transaction at the store. This Bible has an inscription, seemingly a message to God. It seems that the author is in some kind of cult alongside two people named Batiste and Charlotte, although the author doesn't really believe any of it. She found comfort through voodoo while waiting for a sign from her own deity. Ugh, maybe some of Jeremy's ramblings were right. Carnby makes his way through the rest of the basement, walking upstairs and unlocking the front door for Emily. The two are quickly caught and confronted by an employee and some of the patients. Using Emily's connection to Jeremy, Carnby sweet talks his way into getting to investigate. He remarks that one of the patients, a young girl named Grace, looks familiar, but his attention is quickly drawn back to the employee. It sounds like Jeremy's missing. The two decide to search his room to look for clues. It seems that Jeremy was somewhat of an artist. His journal contains ramblings about this dark man character, as well as a wish to make his way to a place called Tarawea. Jeremy states 
notes that he purchased a talisman from a voodoo priestess named Miss Jackson. He once again claims that all of the residents of Dersetta will call upon evil to enter this world. Carnby stumbles upon a diagram of what seems to be Jeremy's talisman, but before he can get a good look at it, Emily requests some help with some old paintings. The sound design in this game is incredible. Just watch this clip. Oh wow. That's striking. I want to save this one. Go see Dr. Gray. Come on, let's go. Yeah, I'm coming. The way that they use audio to convey how Carnby is mesmerized by this painting before tearing it out of frame and muffling his audio as he slowly comes back to his senses is so freaking cool. They do stuff like this all the time, although this is still my favorite example. Emily steps out of the room and calls for Edward to follow, but she's mysteriously gone when he tries to join her. Carnby turns around, realizing that the world outside of Dersetto has completely changed. Alone in the Dark is really good about instantly transitioning you from one version of your location to another in a way that feels natural. Sometimes the changes are even a little bit more subtle, but you can tell from the lighting when you've shifted. Outside of Jeremy's room, Dersetto has completely changed. Carnby takes the stairs down into an alleyway where a strange creature stands ominously in the fog. Hey there. Oh my god! That was such a good cop-out. Oh, you clever bastard. I love a good subversion of expectations, and as you heard, that caught me completely off guard. You can actually hear the monster on the left before you step out, teaching you what noises the enemies make through the use of a scare. Carnby heads further through the streets, locating a store with some lights on and making his way closer. I think this game looks absolutely great most of the time. It's really dependent on the lighting. Areas like this look wonderful, but the lighting in Dersetto itself is not the most flattering for the character models. In general, the character models are probably the weakest point visually, but they're by no means bad. Let them get inside our compare. They're not the good guy. Are you... Is this your store? There are no owners here. We both strangers in Jeremy's store. Jeremy did this? How? The pack with the dog man. Jeremy warned us, but we didn't think much of it. I'm Detective Edward Carnby. I was hired by Jeremy's niece to find him. Oh, yeah? How much you paying you? $150? <laughs> She's sure getting her money's worth tonight. It seems that Jeremy made a pact with the Dark Man, which somehow allowed for the creation of a world like this. The Dersetta residents didn't believe Jeremy, and it seems that the man before us came to regret that choice. The man does not introduce himself, but he's shockingly trusting. He tells Carnby that Jeremy guides himself through this world using his talisman. The man is shocked at Carnby's familiarity with the talisman and Miss Jackson, the voodoo priestess. He directs him down the road towards the shop where Jeremy bought the thing. This was a little confusing when I originally played it because I didn't pay enough attention to the notes. I'm not huge on games that force you to learn important parts of the story through reading. Even something as simple as having Edward stop for a moment to recount a summary of his findings in the notes would have been really cool. Some of the story beats just aren't very well explained, but thankfully there is a summary in the objective section of the menu, which really comes in handy. It seems that this world is built from Jeremy's scattered memories. Also, the man we talked to is Batiste. You know, one of the people who's supposedly in a cult? We'll have to be cautious around him. As Carnby tries to make his way to the voodoo shop, he gets stopped in his tracks by a monster. This is where they introduce stealth mechanics, which honestly aren't great. Carnby's crouch is more of a stoop than anything, and the trajectory of thrown objects isn't the most accurate. What may look like a smooth arc to you could be interrupted by a seemingly insignificant nearby object. Monsters also just sometimes ignore your distractions, which makes sneaking past them at a crawl even harder. You have to hold down the throw button to move and aim instead of toggling, which can impede movement. Stealth really isn't worth it except for in a few special circumstances. Just pick up a pipe and smash it over the enemy's head instead. Combat actually feels pretty good, especially regarding your ranged arsenal. Each gun feels 
feels different and functions in a different way, encouraging you to swap weapons depending on your circumstances. Aiming with melee can be clunky, but it's not bad. The weapons do break though, so be careful. Carnby moves forward, taking out some more enemies and investigating Miss Jackson's voodoo shop. There's a talisman inside which Edward takes for himself. It has three rotating discs labeled with various numbers. Carnby finds a diagram of these dials inside of Jeremy's diary, setting his talisman to display the same code and setting it in a slot on the table. A lens in the center shows images of the shop. A door in the corner opens up, glowing from inside. When Carnby steps through, he ends up in Dr. Gray's office. Gray is a total creep and he has no information on Jeremy's whereabouts. He's completely unsurprised that Edward talked to Batiste, which kind of confuses me. If Batiste was in that other world without a talisman, wouldn't he be missing too? When did he transfer over there? Carnby steps outside, running into Emily. Detective Carnby, how did you... where did you go? I was just talking to Dr. Gray. You disappeared. No, it's not what you think. Have you... have you found anything strange going on here? Yes. Everyone is being incredibly evasive and I can't figure out why. No, I mean something you can't explain. Paranormal, even. Detective, I really need you to get yourself together. I can't do this alone. Forget it. I'll figure it out. Do you want to come see Dr. Gray? No, I want to. I want to try something out with his talisman. I think I can follow Jeremy to the place he mentioned in the book. What was the name? Do you remember something Spanish? T Tarawea. Yeah, that's where I need to go. Detective, are you going to be all right? Yeah, of course. Go talk to Dr. Gray. We'll rendezvous later. I love the performance here. Carnby is clearly freaked out, but he's also super intrigued, almost obsessed. The frantic line delivery is so incredibly well done, and it takes the character in a direction that I wouldn't have really predicted. I really like this. Carnby realizes that if he can figure out how to use the talisman, he can use it to find Jeremy. Even if Emily thinks he's crazy, he's determined to solve this case. Real quick, I want to go through the inventory menu. It is so clean. You have a grid of all of your items that you can look through, and the game will automatically archive obsolete ones into a separate area, which is so helpful. I've always hated having to manually throw things out, so this really just cuts out the middleman. There's also a map that functions basically identical to the modern Resident Evil games. It's color-coded, has a legend full of helpful markers, and is just overall super nice and organized. There's also a menu for keeping track of collectibles that you find across the map. These don't serve any major purposes, they just kind of act as ways to get easter eggs and clues when you complete the sets. Many of these are only accessible as certain characters, and your progress carries over from route to route. Well, it's supposed to anyway, mine just straight up didn't for some reason. Unfortunately for me, the collectible system as a whole broke a lot more than that for a good portion of the game. All of the collectibles that I had gotten just completely disappeared, even when I had literally just picked one up. They thankfully reappeared a few chapters later, but it was really discouraging during that time. Carnaby heads upstairs. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, detective. Didn't mean to obstruct justice or anything. That's fine. You know, I'm kind of busy with my own case of a missing person. I, I was wondering if you've seen Grace, a girl about yay high. I can't say that I have. Why are you asking? Well, I'm looking for her. Is she in trouble? No, 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 no. Uh, she's just uh, hiding somewhere. We can't have a rascal like that running around unchecked at a time like this, you understand? Well, I haven't seen her. Well, let me know if you find her. I'll be around. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for your man, Jeremy. You scratch my back, detective, and I'll scratch yours. This place is full of creeps, but that's unimportant for right now, because it sounds like Grace is missing too. Carnby makes his way to the library, finding a book detailing the history of Dersetto. It used to be a tobacco plantation surrounded by rumors of witchcraft until after the Civil War. All the slaves working there refused to leave when given the opportunity. It was destroyed and rebuilt as a headquarters for a colony of artists, although all 12 artists disappeared following a hurricane in 1915. Carnby tries to open the balcony, but the world shifts again, leaving him in a burning room flooding with dark liquid. The balcony is chained shut, but some nearby bolt cutters make quick work of it. Using them shifts Carnby back to Dersetto. What happened? Everything's normal again? 
That was so cool. Carnby uses his bolt cutters on a locked shed in the garden, finding a water hose that can be used to fill up this hole in the corner. This allows the bucket at the bottom to float upwards, revealing a piece of an ornate plate sitting inside. The detective brings this back to the second floor, where a grandfather clock opens up, revealing other parts of the broken plate. He slots his in, then begins his search for the next one. Downstairs, Carnby finds some patient files, giving him information on the residents of Derceto. He learns of Cassandra Beauregard, a depressed crime author with a drug addiction. That's the name of the other cultist mentioned in the Bible from earlier. Grace's father is dead, and her mother left her at Derceto to, and I quote, avoid further perversion of Grace's adolescence, whatever the heck that means. McCarthy, the drunkard from earlier, is an ex-lawyer that admitted himself to Derceto to get some rest. He's an alcoholic and is distrustful of everyone. A woman named Perosi is also listed, which is concerning considering the fact that Jeremy's notebook claimed that someone named Perosi was dead. He was hoping to see her again in Teroea. She's an amnesiac of some kind, claiming to have been part of the artist colony from 20 years ago. Her story doesn't add up, though, because she's only 30. Ruth, one of the patients we met in the entryway, was admitted to Derceto to keep her from ruining her family's reputation through her nymphomania. Carnby finds Akita Perosi's room and takes a look around. The decor is weird, with the bed being placed right in the middle of the room. He finds a diary with a dial that converts star signs into numbers. To find the code, Edward locates a row of portraits on the wall. Some have a pattern of rot on the front, while others have it on the back. He lines them up using the rot as a guide, finding the only three nameplates remaining visible. After comparing them to some wall art of the artist's colony, he learns the number associated with each of the three remaining names. When plugged into the dial, the number sequence reveals the code to a padlock. I think this is a great puzzle. Alone in the Dark really seems to like puzzles where you reorganize scrambled images and patterns, but this one was way more interesting. It feels like something you could find in an escape room, using your surroundings to decipher a code. With the lock removed, Carnby pulls open the drawer, finding another piece of the ornate plate. The hallway outside shifts into a reality brimming with vegetation and slime. Carnby sprints through the sludge, scrambling to place the plate shard in the clock. This is a simple tile scrambling puzzle that ends by opening a slot for the talisman. I think the clock broke. Or maybe it just stopped at a very precise place. This is one of those verbal hints that you can disable that I think give way too much away. This isn't that difficult of a puzzle, and immediately telling you that the clock's positioning is intentional makes it even easier. A puzzle's not really fun if it doesn't make you think. The talisman lens shows reflections of the hallway to Jeremy's room. That transition was pretty rough compared to normal, with the lag making it less seamless than usual. This is one of the common issues I experienced throughout the whole game. Some of the transitions are completely smooth, while others drop performance for a fraction of a second. I initially thought that this was because I had the game on max graphics settings, but I experienced the same issues when I lowered them, and I was getting a smooth 100 plus frames during traditional gameplay. Another glowing door is revealed, leading to another one of Jeremy's memories. It takes place in a swamp, with enemies trudging through the water in the distance. This really made me feel like I wasn't safe from any direction, which I think is wonderfully executed. It does not help that I am super afraid of water, especially in games. As Carnby continues to explore, he's confronted by a new enemy type that burrows beneath him and needs to be baited out before launching an attack. They even have a full stealth section, which I actually liked a lot. The mechanics worked perfectly this time, and I managed to get through without detection. Being able to see the trails but not the enemy added some extra tension that really heightened the intensity of the sequence for me. Carnby finds an oil rig, activating it with a lever, then climbing atop it. That proved to be a good idea, since the rig malfunctions and starts ejecting oil everywhere. The nearby open flames ignite the liquid, trapping the detective. He climbs higher, noticing a cable leading to safety as well as a thick cloth nearby. Carnby would rather risk falling to death than burning to death, so he tosses the cloth over the cable and zip lines to safety. Unfortunately, this path leads to a body of water. That thing's scary as hell, and it did not help that I was in the water for that sequence. Oh my god. The entire rest of the time I was walking through that area, I was horrified that it would hear me and come back. Carnby finds a mud hut, ducking inside. Don't come any closer. I'm armed. Get that thing out of my face. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm just a detective trying to find something called Tarawea. You're after Jeremy, too? Why? I'm working for his niece. She wants to make sure he's all right. He might be unharmed. 
but far from all right. He's a curse upon DeSetto. Ah, uh, here we go again. Quiet! Back at Derseto, Carnby managed to grab a case containing the sitting room key and a pallet knife. This can be used to unlock doors jammed with wedges or rocks. It also contains a book that Jeremy was very fond of, written by a man named Juan. It's an inspirational text about divinity and forging your own destiny. The book contains the diagram of a constellation, with one of the stars circled and labeled the Great Library. Carnby uses the pallet knife to unlock a room connected to the library, discovering a telescope. While Edward would love to use that to search for the constellation, its magnification isn't nearly strong enough to do so. He'll have to find a way around that. Carnby picks up the cellar key from the table and moves on for the time being. He unlocks the sitting room, which gains him access to Grace and Cassandra's rooms. Grace's room has a Jack in the Box that I think is a reference to Jack in the Dark, since you play as Grace in that game. There's also a note from Ruth asking Grace to complete a mask for her in preparation for a feast later tonight. The detective enters Cassandra's room, running into Grace. Do I know you from somewhere? I remember you, Mr. Carnby. From where? Don't touch that. Cassandra wouldn't like it. She wouldn't like it at all. Do you know where she is? I'd rather not talk about it. It makes me upset. Besides, she'll be back after the Feast of St. John. You think? Yep. It's all on the page, Mr. Conby. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right. I'm gonna go now, if that's okay. I don't like to stay too long in the same place. Mr. McCoffee might find me. Hey. Is he mean to you? Not everyone needs to be saved, Mr. Conby. You should know that by now. This child freaks me the fuck out. This room contains another rot puzzle, this time utilizing bottles of medicine. Three are in the room, but the fourth is missing. There's another Zodiac padlock here as well. Carnby uses his pallet knife to open another door, running into Ruth again. What happened here? This place looks like it was hit by a bomb. Did the ceiling just collapse? The truth is, I don't know why the room looks like this. But I bet your friend Jeremy does. You know where I could find him? Oh, Somewhere in his past, I suppose. He keeps going on about that mysterious dark man. I think he is hiding from him. Or maybe he's with him. I can't really keep up. What the hell? Ruth is implying that she knows about Jeremy exploring his own memories with the talisman, although she's vague enough that we can't really push her on it. She's already been making me pretty uncomfortable, but knowing that she's probably hiding something about the situation makes me trust her even less. Carnby explores the destroyed room, finding a tower that leads up to the attic. The doors at both the top and the bottom are locked. Also, this window is hilariously bad looking. Edward finds a medicine box key and some debris, which he can then use to get the final piece for the rot puzzle. But first, it's time to use that cellar key. Carnby spots something at the end into the wine cellar, but it's blocked off by an electrified puddle. He turns off the breaker and heads over, finding a valve handle. This can be used in the boiler room to shut off some dangerous steam. With the path cleared, the detective finds Jeremy. Well, it looks like Jeremy. He's quickly engulfed in some kind of fungus before disappearing. The lights turn back on, revealing a broken piece of another plate. Now that things are visible again, Carnby finds another broken plate slot, placing his piece inside. He still needs to find another, so he decides to use that medicine box key to get the final vial. Back in Cassandra's room, Carnby uses the bottles, organizing them in a manner that ensures that the rot pattern lines up. The rot made the shape of a snake. There must be something important to find here. Maybe it has something to do with the numbers on the labels. Oh, come on! Let me do the puzzle on my own! Carnby releases the lock, retrieving the other piece of the plate and returning to the boiler room to assemble the pieces. This time, the valves reveal the talisman code, with the lens showing images of the boiler room itself. When he steps outside, he finds himself in an overgrown graveyard. There's a nearby statue with a disc that can be used to unlock a door when oriented correctly. This door leads to a chapel with slots for three discs. Carnby moves down a side path, searching for the other two discs. There are some shotgun shells here, so I thought that that meant I would be 
be getting a shotgun soon. What it actually meant was that the shotgun in a case on the wall in the library has been accessible for a while, and I somehow walked right past it multiple times. This whole area intends for you to stealth through it, but I just took the enemies out normally and moved on. There's an underground tunnel past them with another disc inside. Carnby exits the tunnel, watching as the entrance to a building blows up and monsters pour through. This is where I learned how overpowered the dodge mechanic is. You can use the burst of speed to create enough distance to reload, and there is no cooldown. In the basement of the burning building, there's a door built for two discs. This menu is incredibly blurry for some reason. After opening the door, a chase ensues. You can just dodge past everyone for the most part. The end of the tunnel reveals the third and final disc, which Carnby uses to unlock the chapel. Please don't touch her. Jeremy. What are you doing here? Everyone's looking for you. I know, it, it's all a big mess. No one understands. I, I'm just trying to keep evil at bay. Just for a little while longer. You've got to come back with me. Your niece is waiting at Dorsetto. Emily? Why would you... My letter. I keep making it worse. What is going on, Jeremy? How is any of this happening? I made... I made it terrible promise with someone. The Dark Man. Who is he? No, 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 don't say his name. He can hear us. He's always listening. Jeremy, I need to understand what is going on. I promised him everything. When the sun rises, I will be chained in his sunken desert temple for an eternity. But at least the evil are back to awaken and to settle won't harm anyone outside of that cursed place. You're acting crazy, Jeremy. I want to help. There's nothing you can do. And what's all the business about Teruea? Why did you want to go there? Oh, I can't go there. Not allowed. But you wanted to. Can I go? Tell me, will it help me to break your pact? Is there something there that would help? Why would you give me hope? That's so cruel. Okay. Sounds like we're onto something here. What should I- Look out! Behind you! Run! Don't let it take you! Jeremy's deal with the Dark Man states that if he gives away his life, spending the rest of his days chained up in the Dark Man's temple, whatever evil is awakening in Derceto will be contained to the manor. Barossi's body has returned to Derceto, where she can rest peacefully. The key to the trunk in Jeremy's room lays next to her. Carnby takes it, using it and finding a telescope lens inside. This might be the extra magnification needed to find the constellation of the Great Library. Something kind of weird happened here. The map shows rooms that you fully explored as blue, but Batiste's room reverted to red, even though I had already explored it. I decided to check it out, finding a fountain pen on the table. When I picked it up, it told me that my inventory already had the maximum amount of pens before completely freezing me in place. I could look around, but I could not move. I later found out on my second playthrough that that pen was not supposed to be there for Carnby, it was only supposed to be there for Emily. When Edward picked it up, the game just completely broke. After reloading and entering the room with the telescope, Carnby makes some adjustments until the star showing the library appears. Another shape puzzle reveals the next code, which the talisman inputs all on its own. The lens showed the dining room, so the detective makes his way there. This is where I noticed the shotgun case being open. The gateway in the dining room leads to the Great Library, Teroea. I'm glad to see you made it. I had my doubts, but the hope you instilled has yet abandoned me. I guess this must be Teroea. Who are you? My name is Juan Luis Jorge, and this is indeed the convent of Teroea. You'll have to excuse me, but Jeremy never got your name. The name's Edward Carnby. I'm a private investigator. You're not a patient, are you? No. I'm the author of a book that Jeremy once found important. How does that work? Are you part of this memory as well? Is this even a memory? I think calling me a manifestation of Jeremy's subconscious would be more correct. And so is the convent of Taroeya. I'm a man Jeremy has never met, and we are in a place that he has never been. Okay. So are you here to guide me or something? I have no more purpose than you do. I simply am. 
I will happily help you, of course, if I'm able. If you are already somehow part of Jeremy, why did he want to come here? Isn't he sort of here already? Jeremy wanted to come here because it's a representation of his mind at peace. When Dr. Gray asks him to find his focus during his sessions, this far-flung convent is what Jeremy imagines. He is under the impression that if he could physically come here, he would reach a perfect equanimity. A spiritual apotheosis. You don't think it would work? Jeremy subconsciously knows it's just wishful thinking. He can't come here. Despite the pathways opened by the dark man between their seto and Jeremy's psyche, it's simply not possible. But I'm here. <laughs> Indeed. It's a shame it's just another place for you, detective. Otherwise, you could have become a Buddha. Always a bridesmaid, never a blushing bride. Am I right? <laughs> yes, I suppose so. You'll have to chase enlightenment elsewhere. So what's the next best thing? What can I do here? You should seek out the convent library and try to find the truth about Yermi's relationship with the Dark Man. It's the sort of knowledge he represses and is unable to reflect on. Will it tell me how to break the pact? Perhaps. At least you'll have something to confront Yermi with. Wait, why can't you just tell me? I don't know such things. You'd be better off consulting the text of Dr. Freud if you want such answers. <laughs> no thanks, I hate shrinks. There is another thing you should know about the library. He is here as well. The Dark Man has been working his way through the text for a long, long time. He's here? How am I supposed to get past him? Be careful, detective. Oh jeez, just perfect. If the Dark Man is here, Carnby is going to have to be very careful. When he asks Juan for tips on dealing with the Dark Man, he claims that simply paying him no mind might be the key. Suppose we'll find out when the time comes. Carnby enters the library, and it's gorgeous. Just look at that. This highlights how integral lighting is for this game. Edward moves up the stairs, acquiring an unusual title called the Key of Hubertus. As he examines it, the Dark Man manifests, blocking off the pathway and leaving the only exit as an elevator on the top floor. This chase is pretty cool, if a bit hard to understand at first. You have to use the key you just got on a bunch of pedestals that release ladders to climb and progress. I'm sure it would have been easier if my ears weren't bleeding since the volume for this chase is so loud that I had to take my headphones off to think straight. There's a couple of scenes like this throughout the game where it just kind of ignores your sound settings? Not sure what the deal with that is. Carnby activates the pedestals, climbing to the top floor and rushing into the elevator. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds. He was a kind of itinerant showman who held forth in public halls and aroused widespread fear. The New Orleans address of the event is lost, but I remember distinctly the Prext shipping company pressing their contribution. Hey. <laughs> Detective! One! One! I hope you found what you were looking for. I fear there is no going back. I was so close. There must be something I can work with. Come on, Carnby, think. Think! The shipping cup. Prexed. Right. Good luck, detective. That scene was incredible. The dark man's sway over Carnby is haunting, complemented perfectly by the desperation in the performance. Plus, we get a way better look at the dark man with those awesome wings sticking out of his head. Juan disappears, leaving Carnby to wake up in the elevator back at Derceto. Ruth is here, tag teaming her liver and her lungs. I heard you're trying to break Jeremy's promise to the dark man. Yeah. Do you know anything about that kind of stuff? No, but it makes you wonder. If he made a promise, can't he simply stand by his words?
Look, I'm just trying to get Jeremy out of a bad deal, so he'll come back with us to New Orleans. Well, if all fails... What are you doing? <laughs> it's a sign of submission to the Dark Man. I saw it in a dream once. What? You don't know the Prex's shipping company by any chance. I do. They made big money during the war. Their waterfront office is just over there. How did you do that? Do what, detective? <laughs> Bonne chance. How does Ruth know any of this? And how the hell does she have control over the memory world without a talisman? Is that actually Ruth, or was she a fake like the Jeremy in the boiler room? Carnby is now at a harbor, swarming with fog and monsters. He breaks into a building to get the key for a crane, freeing up a path to the sewers. The game spawns six enemies on me all at once, just for fun, I guess? When I respawn to try again, it only spawns three. This happened during both of my playthroughs, too. Carnby navigates the sewers, finding a path inside one of the buildings. Upstairs, he finds a Tommy gun, which looks frickin' great on him. There are some papers here, too, but that is substantially less cool. Before he can get to the door, it bursts open with another troop of monsters behind it. They even set the door on fire so Carnby can't dodge past. How sweet of them. Thankfully, they can't climb stairs, so it is a pathetically easy fight. The fog is moved, allowing access to a new building. Carnby makes his way to the top floor, entering the only room, a stage. Jeremy is here, solemnly recounting his first interaction with the Dark Man. He calls him the Black Pharaoh, an ancient magician who has lived a thousand lives and worn a thousand masks. Woo! Carnby mocks him, asking if Jeremy's mind was really invaded by some kind of stage magician, but Jeremy brings up a good point. The magical powers are real, otherwise they wouldn't be here in the first place. Edward wants to know how to break the contract, but Jeremy refuses to tell him. Doing so would turn her loose on the world, causing countless innocents to die. The only information Carnby manages to get is that the method of breaking the contract is somewhere in the Dark Man's temple. Guess it's time to find our way there. Carnby finds the next talisman code on a sarcophagus. The sarcophagus itself is the next gateway, making for one of my favorite visuals in the entire game. Carnby makes his way to the end of the tunnel, finding himself in the middle of the desert. This is another memory, meaning the temple has to be somewhere nearby. A hole in the ground certainly looks like a temple entrance. The detective grabs a rope and descends. Through an assortment of different puzzles with reflective lenses and lasers, Carnby opens up secret passageways. This gives off major Indiana Jones vibes, which is pretty fun. There are a lot of flying creatures here that you can burn with the lasers. After activating all the lenses, he lines up the beams with one statue in the middle, channeling all three beams into one stronger beam that reveals the location of the contract. This in turn causes the temple to start falling apart. This is a pretty neat chase scene with some closing passageways and enemies to defeat. I managed to dodge on top of one of the enemy's head and just walk straight over top of them. Not sure how that happened. Carnby makes his way over to the center of the room, opening a box and retrieving both a sacrificial dagger and the contract. Before he can even read it all the way through, a group of flying beasts envelop him, carrying the detective away. Hey. Hey, detective? <sighs> what are you doing? Oh, I found some. Great. Was it alcohol? God, no. I just got the wind knocked out of me. I think I know how to break the contract with the Dark Man. What exactly does that mean? Everything going back to normal. Uh, all right. Uh, I found some more information on Dorsetto and the patients. There are some seriously strange things going on here. I'm pretty sure two of the patients are dead, and maybe even the clerk. Oh, yeah. I kind of just gave up on worrying about that. Well, just keep your eyes open, I suppose. What were you doing again? Jeremy made a pact with the Dark Man to keep all the madness locked inside Dorsetto. All right. I'm gonna break it. I just have to... Where is it? Where's the talisman? It's around your neck. Ah! Oh. Ah! Oh. I worry, detective. Don't. I'm fine. I worry that you're not much help on this case. But at least you're a good distraction. Trust me. You're getting your money's worth. At this rate, I'm an absolute bargain. I love Edward Carnby so freaking much. This is such a fun direction to take the character. Edward takes a look at the contract one more time. 
Medicine has failed me. Nothing can be done to dispel the Heartwood curse. Only the sacrificial dagger may release the despair from Jacob's eye. Yet doing so would be the doom of Derceto. Let this curse of mine be a weapon for once. I accept your demands, O oh, crawling chaos. Build your prison around this godforsaken hospital. When evil has been starved, I will stay buried forever. This is clearly Jeremy speaking, but I don't know what half of this means. We know he's subjecting himself to an eternity of imprisonment to use Derceto as a prison for whatever evil he thinks will be unleashed. But what's this about releasing the despair from Jacob's eye? Carnby leaves the attic, running into some familiar faces. <sighs> Got to be around here somewhere. He wouldn't leave this house. I don't know what to think anymore. You run into that detective fella. Who is he? Can he be trusted? I think he wanted a good guy. Well, you know, not good. Will he be all right with her coming? Praise the mother. He don't need nobody all that. He just help the job. Just calm down. It ain't time yet. God, it hurts. As far as I can tell, Detective Combi seems to be solving problems, not causing them. Just be ready in case he starts anything. Talk like that leaves Edward uncomfortable and unsure of who to trust. For now, he'll have to avoid those two and make his way to Dr. Gray's office. Maybe there's some more information there. Many of the normal pathways are blocked off this time around, forcing Carnby to use alternative pathways like ladders to traverse Derceto. Dr. Gray's office is unfortunately locked, but that's not going to stop Carnby. He looks around, running into McCarthy and Grace. Detective Carnby, good to see you again. Solved the case yet? I'm trying. Hey, Grace, you okay? Oh, she is just peachy, detective. Are you looking forward to the Feast of St. John, Grace? I can't wait. Kids, ain't they great? What exactly are you planning for tonight? Oh, not much. We eat, we drink, we pay tribute to the wishing tree in the conservatory. The usual. Then why all the excitement? There is just something about tonight, something different. I think we all feel it. Besides, we got ourselves some new words for the prayer thanks to your buddy Jeremy. She'll come and turn the world inside out, and things will begin again. That sounds strangely threatening. You should come. Oh, God damn it, Grace. Stay put for once. McCarthy stumbled, jostled a key from his pocket and onto the floor, giving Carnby access to a new hallway. This leads to McCarthy's room, Ruth's room, and an empty room. At the end of the hallway, the dark man makes his entrance. He's no threat currently, and he just kind of disappears the second you look away. McCarthy's room has something shoved into an air vent, but there's no way to pry it open yet. Carnby decides to investigate the room that the dark man stepped out of. This is my room. I belong here. That's weird. How can this be Edward's room? He hadn't even heard of this place until getting hired by Emily. He peels away the wallpaper, revealing an assortment of messages that he claims to have written himself. The most important one is the number in the corner. It matches up with Carnby's detective ID number. The three digits replaced by X's are the combination to the safe by the wall. This is another awesome puzzle where you can use something seemingly insignificant to progress. That ID has been in your inventory for the entire game, with its only mention being Dr. Gray when he asks for proof of your identification at the end of chapter one. They drew your attention to it just enough that you would be be able to solve the puzzle later on, and I love it. The safe contains a coin and a letter from McCarthy. Detective, I have made many discoveries in my case. The child we want is safe, thanks to good people like me and you. We are so similar, but you don't see all the things I do. To find your man, Jeremy, you also need to look for the girl. It has always been that way. The young deliver us all. You should have a look in my room. There's a piece of the puzzle you will need. Take care now. My coffee. How long have I been here? This is fascinating, and Carnby poses an interesting question. How long has he been here? Something feels wrong. He's so familiar with the room and everything inside, but how? McCarthy's letter just creates even more confusion. Carnby uses the coin to unscrew the vent and retrieve a drawing made by Grace. The world shifts as he exits, morphing into a swamp. Edward fights his way back to Grace's room, lining up his drawing alongside seven others in yet another rot puzzle. 
Once the sequence is completed, the talisman sets itself once again. The hallway outside the room has entirely changed, leaving Carnby in a very familiar place, his office. There's a ghostly silhouette of himself laying at the table, unconscious and surrounded by booze. Documentation scattered about reveals that this is a memory from 1928 when Carnby was working for a client named Gabriella Saunders, Grace's mother. He gathers clues from around the room, organizing it on his corkboard and using thread to connect them. I remember this case. Some kid got taken by her father, headed out of state, but he had made a mistake by selling a painting that his wife actually cared about to a collector named Thornhill to fund his venture. That's how I tracked him down. A red thread detaches itself from the board, leading the detective through the streets and down memory lane. As he progresses further and further, he remembers more about this case that he's shut out of his mind. Carnby uses some external motivation on the collector who bought the painting that Grace's father sold, learning where he was headed. On the way there, Carnby got stopped by a gang that he owed money to. Probably for gambling, but who knows at this point. He's in a lot of debt. He crashed his car, knocking some heads together and sending the conscious ones running. Using the hotel ledger, Carnby matched the handwriting to locate where the Saunders were staying, negating the careful use of an alias when checking in. The room was empty of occupants, but not of clues. That's right, he was running away, ditching his old life and marriage in New Orleans to find something better in Tallahassee. And he took his daughter with him against the will of the mother. That's why she hired me, but I stopped him. I caught up with him at the Pearl River Bridge. Edward makes his way to the bridge, stumbling into Grace of all people. I can't believe I didn't recognize you. I looked a little different back then, I suppose. Was any of this real? How do you mean? This day, just... So much is happening. I can't... I think I've lost my head. Do you need me to apologize? I mean... I am sorry. I don't think I need to begin to explain. You, you're just a kid, Grace. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean for it to happen. Lies. More lies. No, really. I thought I was being a good guy by handing you over to your mother. I didn't know. I, I couldn't have known that she wouldn't care about you. I don't know how this works. What is this for? Some form of admission of guilt. Maybe acceptance. It's what the dark man wants. Edward ran the Saunders off the road, then dove into the river to save them. But when he was down there, he only freed Grace. He had all the time that he needed to save her father. But he let the man drown, leaving Grace with a greedy mother who couldn't care less about her daughter. Grace claims that in the memory, both she and her father are still down there. Carnby raises the bridge, grabbing the boat from the first building and making his way to the vehicle. This shouldn't have been all that difficult. I just had to shoot some tentacles off the bridge and get rid of more of those bad things. But the game glitched here, really, really badly. Whenever I would walk up to a melee weapon, it would claim that my inventory was full, even though the melee slot was completely empty. This left me unable to use melee on the tentacles, meaning I would be softlocked if I missed shots or ran out of ammo. The hitboxes on the tentacles are also impossible to identify, making things even more risky. I managed to get to the boat and move on, but the melee slot was still glitched when this happened. Are you okay? Don't leave me alone. What the hell have you been doing? What's going on here? Look at this mess! Uh, I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Thompson. Don't make me kick you out of this house! Now get out! <sighs> hey, Detective. Mr. Carnby. I'm really worried about you. I'm okay. I just need to catch my breath for a moment. This place? It's... 
There are some very disturbed figures around here, and I don't think it's just the patients. I've been reading some things about how Dorsetto has a deranging effect on people. I think it might explain... things. What? Just take it easy, okay? I'm gonna go find a way into Dr. Gray's apartment. I want to know what he's hiding. Emily, don't worry. I think I'm close. I'm gonna set everything right. Just be careful. Emily is really good at saying a lot without giving up any information. Every time we've crossed paths, she just tells us that Dersetto makes people crazy and that some of the employees are either missing or dead. It's the same thing phrased differently each time. Kirnby finds a clue in Cassandra's room, the final page she ever wrote. It contains the combination to the safe in the clerk's office. The detective opens it up, finding the key to Dr. Grace. Inside, Carnby finds information on Jeremy's mental state. He's been attaching himself to a metaphor about a steamboat that has run aground. If he puts the ship in reverse, the hole may cause the vessel to sink entirely. Dr. Gray is worried that Jeremy's persuasive nature might lead to some mass delusions. Carnby grabs a key to the infirmary at the bottom of the tower, making his way there and looking through the documentation. One page states that the scans of Jeremy Jeremy's brain are covered in dark clouds, making it impossible to get a good scan without assembling multiple different images together. Another mentions plans to lobotomize Jeremy if all else fails. Carnby grabs all of the pieces of the brain scans, combining them into one coherent image that manifests part of a sculpture. The detective makes his way up the stairs to find the other pieces of the sculpture, but the path is blocked by barrels. Windows shatter and the tower begins to flood with water. Normally you're supposed to break these with melee, but I was stuck wasting shotgun ammo because of the earlier glitch. In the attic, Carnby finds the rest of the sculpture. He assembles the pieces, revealing the next talisman code. Inputting this reveals the next gate, this time present through the hole in the floor. It's the interior of a crashed steamboat, just like in Jeremy's metaphor. Jeremy's voice yells out for help, claiming that the boat's engine isn't working. Carnby makes his way to the engine room, restarting the machinery and using a lifeboat to drop down to the lower deck. Carnby finds a control panel, activating it. Are you ready to tell me what happened in the act? I put a rope around my neck, and then I strangled all the life from my body. Are you under the impression that you died? Uh, yes. No. Uh, I was supposed to die. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that you were supposed uh, to die? Uh, I'm the catalyst. I had to die to make the story happen. What are you referring to, Jeremy? Thirty years ago, Frederick needed me to die. You're not making any sense, Jeremy. Come back. Find hey. your focus. Hey! I cheated everyone. I didn't play my part. Hey! I escaped hey. my doom. My destiny. Again, find hey. your focus. Hey, I'm right here. What the hell is going on? Now everything is wrong. Nothing is in hey! place. Hey! I'm right here! Calm down, Mr. Conby. What do you want? Did... Were you... Were you not talking to Jeremy right now? I haven't seen Jeremy all day. Are you all right, Detective? No. Actually, actually I don't... I don't think so. Well, maybe. I'm gonna go look for Jeremy. Good. Let me know if you find him. Even more confused than before, Carnby decides to join Emily in Dr. Gray's apartment. When he steps inside, the game itself changes format. I think this is really awesome, although the controls definitely don't work as well here. Generally, you're supposed to use tank controls with fixed camera angles to avoid glitching like this. Carnby finds a fake, hollowed-out book on Dr. Gray's desk. When placed on a nearby bookshelf, a hidden doorway is revealed. Inside, Carnby locates a transcript of Jeremy's first meeting with Dr. Gray. In it, Jeremy talks about how he likes to perceive Juan as his friend, even though the real man is long dead. That lines up with our experience in Tarot. Dr. Gray asks if Jeremy has made a habit of fantasizing about the people he reads about. Jeremy states that there's only one other person, Jacob. Dr. Gray asks who that is, with Jeremy simply telling him to turn to the last page. I don't entirely know what he's referring to here. The contract mentions that the only way to break the pact is to release the despair from Jacob's eye using the sacrificial dagger, but that doesn't really explain who Jacob is. There's a document nearby called the Snake Dagger, which gives us a little bit more information. It states that the people who are possessed by demons are considered poisoned in the head meaning an exorcism using the dagger would have to be carried out by stabbing the victim in the eye, like a lobotomy. This Jacob person must be possessed. Suddenly, the phone begins to ring. Hello? It, it, it can't be. Who is this? 
Jeremy? Jeremy is with the Dark Man. You can't save him. Well, I've done everything you wanted so far, and there's just one more thing on the list. I expect him to keep his promise and return Jeremy unharmed. Get out, detective. While you still can. The glass of a nearby clock shatters, revealing a slot for the talisman. There's an engraving in the floor that matches the shape, so Carnby lines the real talisman up the same way. The lens reveals a hidden passageway in the back of the closet. Carnby returns to the room. Miss Hartwood, I think you're gonna wanna see this. Is there something in the closet? Yeah, there is. You don't see the very obvious gate leading to whatever Jeremy's madness is serving up next? I don't understand. Are you making some kind of fashion metaphor? I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Can you just tell me what you're doing? You don't see this. It's fine. It's fine. Catch you later. Are you going inside the closet? Yeah. You got a problem with that? No. Do what you think is right, detective. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Goodbye, Miss Harwood. Carnby steps through the closet, arriving in a snowy tundra. According to my Steam achievements, this is hell. This is your final spoiler warning. If you're considering playing this game for yourself and just want to hear my final thoughts, please skip to the timestamp on screen. I have a melee weapon. <laughs> I am so glad that the glitch fixed itself. Carnby grabs a flare gun from nearby before noticing a notebook. It details the story of Jacob, a member of an expedition to Greenland. He'd been researching an unusual crystallized metal found in several sacred items in Greenland. When the crew arrived at their destination, the metal was found absolutely everywhere. When the sun began setting, the rest of the crew decided to head back to camp, but Jacob was insistent on staying. The temperature would only drop lower, and everyone was worried for his safety. But he threatened violence if anyone tried to stop him from staying. Hesitantly, they just left him. The next day, the storm got worse, and the author of the journal decided to make a final attempt to save Jacob. Using flares as a guide, he braved the storm and climbed towards the Stellarium, only to find Jacob transfixed by some kind of celestial lantern in the sky. He cried out in agony from the injuries that he sustained in the harsh weather. The author called out, and Jacob turned. He seemed almost hollow, telling the author to leave and never return. That's clearly the memory that Carnby is reliving, so he braves the storm in search of Jacob. I was definitely supposed to use the flares to navigate, but just walking straight straightforward led me exactly where I needed to go each time with minimal corrections. Carnby makes his way to the Stellarium, spotting Jacob, just as described. Hey you! What are you doing here? What is this place? Turn back, detective. You're not wanted here. Whoa, take it easy. I'm not your enemy. Oh, you're wrong, detective. You're wrong. Carnby fights for his life, which is tricky since Jacob literally teleports. The detective takes the man out, heading up to the Stellarium and using his talisman to manipulate its position. Jacob's form has mutated even further. Carnby topples him with bullets over and over again, stabbing the man in the chest with the sacrificial dagger each time. The final stab is to the eye, just like what was described in the contract, but before Jacob stumbles off the cliff, he pulls Edward with him. Thank you, Carpe. 
this game is continuously great at confusing me, which is intended as far as I can tell. Carnby wakes up slouched in a wheelchair. How are you feeling, Detective? Never better. How about you two? Hey, Jeremy, I didn't do too much damage, did I? Things are fine. Very quiet. What's up with him? Painkillers? No. You see, despite you... Since the game won't let Dr. Gray finish, I'll summarize it myself. Carnby lobotomized Jeremy with that stab. He'll live, but as a husk of a man. I redid that entire fight, then got back to Derceto. It seems that the pact with the Dark Man was broken. Jacob was stabbed in the eye, which came with some unintended consequences when returning to reality. Carnby explores the conservatory, learning more about the ceremony everyone won't shut up about. Everyone seems much more familiar and friendly with the detective, making me once again question how long he's been here. But here's a great example of how important the lighting is. But who cares about lighting? The ceremony's about to start. Everyone knows what to do? Y'all know the new words. Mrs. Thompson, we talked about this. I'm not sure everyone is comfortable. Doctor, I insist. This is important. We've waited for so long, Doctor. Let's just go with the old song. Not every change is an improvement. Boss, good or bad, we need to move forward. All in, Doc. Let's bet it all. But we don't know what we're dealing with. It'll be okay, Doctor. Better even. Hell, oh, there are praises in abundance to the black goat of the woods. Hear us, brother. Take pity on us. Take pity on us. Hear us, mother, and take pity on us. Take pity on us. Take pity on us. God! Are you crazy? This yes. year's gonna lose the hammock, Carl Bill. Grace! Stop! No! Stop in the grass! Yeah! Stop in the grass! Stop in the grass! Get my uncle out of here! Yeah! Jeremy! Come with me! Get over here! Jeremy, come with me! Jeremy, come here! No! There has to be a sacrifice! We're doomed! The tree, or I guess mother, rampages. It's pretty cool that the final boss is kind of the same thing as the original game. The game hasn't been all that gory up until this point, but they really go ham here. 
I guess the cult talk that we heard about every so often was true, and every single person was in on it. The only one who seemed to not fully be on board was Dr. Gray, but we can't really ask him about it. I suppose this was the evil that Jeremy was worried would be released in Derseto, and now that the contract is broken, the beast won't be contained to the manor. Now that everyone's freaking dead, Carnby prepares for one final fight. I'm letting you guys know right now, the sides of this boss's body are riddled with hole patterns, so if you have trypophobia like me, this might be uncomfortable to look at. The boss itself is actually pretty cool. You have to shoot these bubbling weak points all over while dodging attacks and dealing with other enemies spawning. There's plenty of ammo around so you don't have to worry about running out, but the side enemies will kill you in two hits, so try and be fully aware of your surroundings. Something kind of weird is that my keybinds were fully reset during this fight, making it even more difficult. I thought I was having another melee weapon glitch, but I later learned that the game just doesn't save your custom keybinds when you close it down, which is awful. After figuring that out, rebinding my controls, and doing some trial and error during the fight, the tree monster is successfully taken down. to tell you. There was so much evidence. Their devotion to the black goat was like nothing I've ever seen before. I felt so dumb believing any of it, but I'm glad I did. Oh, you tried to tell me. Really? Really? You tried to tell me? Because I remember you giving me little to no information and leaving me all alone. And if you believed the cult stuff about the black goat, why didn't you believe me when I was talking about the paranormal happenings at Derseto? <clears throat> Sorry about that. Are you okay? Everything is out of order. This isn't the way the story goes. I shouldn't be alive. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome, buddy. How are you doing, sweetie? I kind of like it. You ruined everything, but I'm not mad. All right, you ready to head back to New Orleans? Come on, Jeremy. We're leaving. Can I come? I thought you said you didn't need saving. Don't leave her. She's important. Of course we're taking her with us. So that was Alone in the Dark, or at least one half of it. I really liked this game, despite the glitches, but the story really left me scratching my head. Thankfully, we can gather more information by playing through the game as Emily instead, which is what we're going to be doing right now. A lot of seemingly insignificant things change when you switch characters, but it's all done to convey different parts of the story. The cutscene after Emily and Carnby break into Darsetto is absent of Ruth, and both McCarthy and Grace quickly leave. Carnby doesn't recognize Grace. He's not the main character here, and he won't be confronting his past. Since Emily is taking charge in most of the conversations now, we get to see more of her personality. And I'll be honest, I don't like her. She's really pushy and rude. Even during Carnby's playthrough, she was always so dismissive of the detective. She's just not the most pleasant person to be around, although I do understand that she's stressed. Grace runs back and offers to show the duo to Jeremy's room. There are some small changes here, like the painting being in a more obvious spot where Carnby would stumble into it during his search so that Emily could be the one mesmerized by it. Carnby disappears and Emily is left alone in Jeremy's first memory. Everything is the same up until the meeting with Batiste. <laughs> That you? Batiste? How'd you get here? I was back at Dorsetto. Looking for my Uncle Jeremy? Jeremy's your uncle. I didn't know. Why would you? You're still working at Dorsetto? Yeah, both me and Lada stuck around. We're real orderless now. Y you remember my sister Lada, don't you? What happened, Batiste? How are we here? Do you know about the dark man haunting your uncle? I'm familiar with his mental state. I think we all in his head somehow. Because these streets are real, but they're not like on any map. Nah, this is like when you remember something, but in the wrong way. Do you know how to get back to Dorsetto? I'm not safe here. True words have yet been spoken, Mrs. Marcus. Don't call me that. It's Miss Emily Hartwood. 
There's no reason to call me anything else. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Does Emily have a past at Der Seto unrelated to Jeremy? And Batiste and Lottie are freaking siblings? Plus, why the hell was Batiste so calm around Carnby, who has a visible firearm and a strong build, but he choke slammed the confused woman? He didn't even try and get a better look, he just attacked her. And this is someone that would have looked vaguely familiar to him, because they clearly have some kind of past that is just not explained. Batiste's explanation of the world makes so much sense during this route. I wish I had a conversation closer to this before. I get that Carnby is the detective. He figured out more with less information, but I don't think that means you should sacrifice understanding for the player. When you look in your inventory, you can find out why Emily was so upset when Batiste called her by the wrong name. It seems as though she had a fiancé who went off to war and never came back. After she finds the talisman at Miss Jackson's parlor, the conversation with Dr. Gray implies that she's only met him a single time when they were going to admit Jeremy for the first time. So how come Batiste and Lottie are familiar with Emily, but everyone else isn't? Are you ready to tell me why you are here? Miss Hartwood, and why you brought a detective. I received a letter from my uncle. He seemed certain that he was in danger here. If I find out you're treating him badly, I'll be taking him back with me to New Orleans. Really? Is he going to live with you in your tiny garçonniere? That would be a spectacular way to ratify your spinsterhood. These people both suck. Emily heads outside, running into a confused Carnby. The detective is hesitant to believe her claims, but he tries to be calm and understanding, despite his discomfort. It's... hard to explain. I think I blacked out. I... It was like I went somewhere else. It's okay, miss. You're clearly upset. No, it's... I don't know what's happening. I, this is a very stressful situation for you, I understand. Ugh, no, you don't understand. Just take a deep breath. Why don't you sit down, smoke some of the Perique? If you want, I could even drive you back to New Orleans. I just want to have a talk with Dr. Gray first. I want to stay. I found a talisman just like the one in the painting. I think I might be able to figure out where Tarawea is, where Jeremy wanted to go. That's great. Just stay out of trouble, okay? Let me handle the investigation. Well, there's our second crash. There are many entirely new cutscenes, like Emily meeting Ruth in the library, or finding this lady whose name I never learned burying a mummified cat in the garden as part of some voodoo ritual. The gameplay itself is identical, but from here on out, the cutscenes just kind of turn into worse versions of Carnby's. Jeremy, you dropped your... <gasps> Mrs. Marcus? Get off of me! What are you doing here? Trying to find my uncle. Jeremy is your uncle? How did you know you I was please? looking for Jeremy? I just said uncle. Why is everyone so violent with Emily? Batiste's cutscene gave us more information, but every single other cutscene is completely different in confusing ways. Grace is also a menace in this route. Before, she was just a creepy little girl that was manipulated by a cult, but here she just outright assaults Emily on multiple occasions, and she still gets to come along with them after their setup burns down. Look at the scene when Grace was making the mask. Is that supposed to be my f Ow! You should learn your place, little girl. Why are you acting this way? What did I ever do to you? Grace! Grace! I want to show you some of the weird changes to the cutscenes. I'm going to play Carnby's scene first, then Emily's afterwards, so you can get a direct comparison. What should I- Look out! Behind you! Run! Don't let him take you! <sighs> I don't care. I'll find a way. I have my own talisman, and I know about Tarawaya. Oh, wait, 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 don't speak. Who's in here? Show yourself. You know who, Emily? He took your grandfather. No, I mean it. Who's in here? I can feel someone's in here. Shipping company pressing their contribution. Hey. What is that? It's something. It's something that you could do about it. 
<laughs> Detective! One. One. Company pressing their contribution. Emily! This one really annoys me. Carnby's scene was so much better. The framing, Juan coming in later on, Carnby's reaction to the Dark Man, it was just all so much more dramatic and well timed. One of the only times I think Emily had a better version of a cutscene is right here. The Dark Man has been with me since I was 12 years old. He was standing right on that stage right over there. For a brief moment, his gaze held mine. And that was it. I recognized him for what he was. The heart with guys embodied in flesh. I thought it was my turn. But I was only there to be mocked. Instead, his attention moved on to my father sitting next to me. I turned to him and saw his face. The widest shade of pale I've ever seen. He bit off his tongue that night and suffocated. That was so much better of an explanation of the Dark Man's origin. It was lacking and confusing in Carnby's section, so getting this explanation was really enlightening. And it makes sense that Jeremy would only share this with his niece, not some stranger that he just met. But that doesn't excuse the cutscene being so lackluster for Carnby. Even though the scene was better for Emily, the ending was just terrible. Feels like combining those cutscenes could have resulted in a truly well-paced story. What are you talking about? Is this the thing from the bayou? Juan said something. I'm not your enemy. Tell me where to go. How do I find the temple? No, we can't. I have to make this sacrifice. God damn it, Jeremy. The more I play both sides, the more I realize that they both have their strengths and weaknesses. Carnby's is a substantially better section overall, but there are a lot of moments where Emily's shines. No matter which path you choose, there's a certain level of disappointment. Just look at Emily's scene transition from the temple to the conversation in the attic. Oh, Jeremy. How much pain and suffering do you What are you doing? Detective. How is your investigation going? Well, I still have no clue where Jeremy is, but I think I know why he's hiding. This place is full of lunatics, planning to perform some kind of ritual tonight. Well, that sounds ridiculous. Or rather would have just a day ago. It gets worse. I have reason to believe they killed anyone who didn't want to go along with the plan. Detective? Have you encountered any monsters tonight? I just told you, I think they killed people. Beauregard, the author, Perosi, the singer, Mr. Waits, the clerk, Mr. Chance, the gardener, they're all missing. No, I mean, have you fired your gun tonight? Of course not. They wouldn't just kill outsiders like that. It would bring too much attention. But you should keep your eyes open. So you haven't seen anything strange been anywhere else? What are you trying to tell me, Emily? Are you in some kind of danger? Let me drive you back to New Orleans. I think I have enough. You know, at least get the police to take a look at this case. No, I'm fine. Thank you, detective. I'll find your uncle, Miss Harwood. Just stay out of trouble. Just look at how Carnby acted here. He gave clear and concise information about the clues he discovered about the cult, posed a solid theory about the disappearances, and then actually listened to Emily and tried to get more information when she talked about her paranormal experiences. He was understanding and tried to comfort her as best as he could. Comparatively, Emily was just condescending, distrustful, and outright rude. She found a beaten and battered Carnby on multiple occasions and didn't show anywhere near as much concern as he did for her when merely walking in on her talking to herself. This time around, 
around, we get to see Emily relive a mistake from her past. Her clues are in Ruth's room instead of McCarthy's. While Carnby was taken to his office to relive a past investigation, Emily is taken to the trenches of World War I in search of her husband. This section actually has a really cool stealth segment. The beast from the swamp earlier is roaming the trenches, but it operates through sound alone. I really liked sneaking around and finding the best route, and I think this utilized the monster from the swamp better. Carnby never saw the beast again after that section, so I prefer its use here. The gameplay was cooler for Carnby, but more fun for Emily. After a lot of stealthing, Emily stumbles upon a gruesome scene. John. Oh, John. What's the matter, Emily? I can't do this. Asking them to stand tall. What's the matter? I can't take you dying again. Speak of them proudly. I'm still hurting. What's the matter, Emily? But the war effort in Europe is not our Your death was just so... Shameful. are known as the Spanish flu. The New Orleans City Council decided to open yet another emergency hospital in the old Derseto plantation. She wakes up in a dark room, quickly learning that it's a morgue. Her fiancé's name is clearly listed on one of the tags. <laughs> 217. I didn't know this is where you would end up. I didn't want to know. I stopped visiting you because I couldn't stand the indignity of your awful illness. I was ashamed of you. Ashamed of myself. Forgive me. Please, John. Let me go. <laughs> Are we done here? Is this what you wanted? Wow. I think that was the best performance for Emily out of the whole game. Carnby made a really big mistake in his past, and Emily somehow matched it, maybe even exceeding it. Carnby couldn't have known that Grace's father was trying to save his child, but he still left a man to die. Emily left the love of her life to die alone because she was ashamed of him. That's horrifying, and it makes her breakdown better. Everything becomes mostly the same again, with Emily completing the infirmary's puzzles this time. Take a look at the differences between her final cutscene and the steamboat. Are you ready to tell me what happened? Uh, what's happening? Uh, I put a rope around my neck, and then I strangled uh, all the life from my body. Uncle! Are you under the impression that you died? Yes. No. Uh, uh, I was supposed to die. What does that mean to you? That you were supposed to die? Uh, I'm the catalyst. I had to die to make the story happen. What story? What are you referring to, Jeremy? Thirty years ago, Frederick needed me to die. Jeremy! You're not making any sense, <sighs> Come back. Find your focus. Uncle? I cheated everyone. I didn't play my part. I escaped my doom. <gasps> Destiny! Again. Find your focus. 
Jeremy! Now everything is wrong. <laughs> Nothing is in place. Hey, listen to me. We're gonna drown. Calm down, Miss Hartwood. You're not in any danger. <sighs> but... Jeremy... He was here, wasn't he? Miss Hartwood, I am beginning to suspect your family curse is catching up with you. Have you ever talked to a doctor about your condition? No. No, I, I was just confused. I thought I saw him for a moment. I'm fine. I'll let you be. Miss, I want you to know I'm here to help if you need me. So much less intense than with Carnby. Her transitions from world to world are always so much more gentle, and I don't know why. It makes them a lot less impactful. It's not like the developers are afraid to beat her up either, which just confuses me more. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the results of her battle with Jacob. After me, you're in my head now. In that case, I hope you enjoy your stay. Emily, stop! Don't worry, we got you. Very different, but also super cool. That kind of reaction, especially because of the Heartwood curse of going insane, really worked well. Grace is also kind of weird here, literally asking if the Dark Man is still in her head. I don't know what her deal is in this route. The ritual scene is about the same as before, with the only difference being that Batiste is more gentle with Emily and eventually lets her go to save Grace. Hey, kid. You doing all right? It wasn't what I expected, but you can't always get what you want. I can't wait to throw her into a psych ward. I really enjoyed Alone in the Dark, but I'm not going to pretend it's perfect. I'll start with the bad and end with the good. The story is clunky. I played through the game twice and still only got a good grasp of the story after writing this video script. Forcing the player to learn about vital plot points through reading is never a good thing, even when you have the option of voice acting. Splitting the information across two different playthroughs make things feel detached and even more confusing. No matter which side you do, there's a certain level of dissatisfaction that'll follow. I would have been a lot happier if there was a way to get all of the information in one playthrough, maybe by having both characters experience experience different paranormal worlds before sharing their stories with one another and fully teaming up for the second half of the game. The way it was written, no matter which side you play through, part of the case will remain unsolved, and one of the protagonists will never confront their past. There were quite a lot of glitches, especially nearing the end of Carnby's run-through. The performance drops when transitioning from area to area, no matter what graphic settings you have selected. Even some cutscenes had lag, despite being locked to 60 frames per second. I honestly would have preferred a third delay if it meant having a smoother overall experience with less glitches. I'm still confused at why so many seemingly insignificant cutscenes were changed. I understand cutscenes with Jeremy being different since it's the man's niece instead of a stranger, but scenes like the library escape were just worsened for no specific reason. The game's also pretty short. It took me seven and a half hours to beat it at a leisurely pace during my first playthrough, and only four and a half during my second because I knew how to solve all the puzzles. Also, I was playing on easy that one. It's up to you to decide if that's worth it for the price. Despite all of that, I really did love this game. The atmosphere and vibes were incredible. I love a good 1920s noir vibe, and they really knocked it out of the park. The music is great and the sound design is incredible. The environments look gorgeous and Carnby's cutscenes specifically had great framing and pacing. The gameplay itself is super fun. If you're looking for a game with great combat, you're gonna be disappointed. It's pretty average. But if you're looking for a horror experience with some great puzzles, you're gonna have a great time. I'm still not over how well organized all the menus were. I hope to see more games that give you access to this much information in detail. It would have been even better without the collectible glitches. I was so happy playing this game that I spent the majority of my playthrough with a big goofy grin on. If anyone had walked into my room, I'm sure they would have thought I was going insane. If you have any interest in picking up this game for yourself, definitely play as Carnby first. It's a much better experience overall with a much more likable character. Alone in the Dark 
Ark is a really solid game. I loved it, and I'll absolutely be playing through it again every time that they release updates and patches. It could definitely use some more polish, so I truly do hope that the developers will take feedback into account and push out some updates. That way, this game can become the best version of itself possible. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.